Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good evening, and welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. Thank you again for tuning in. I am very excited about my guest this evening. My name is Andrea Judici. I am your host, and as usual, I have my guide dog with me, who I'm not introducing for our safety and his focus. Tonight, we're going to talk about what I'm calling all the colors of blindness, because it seems like a cool name. The reason that I am talking about this this evening is because having been blind for my whole life so far, I have noticed that there are a lot of things that people seem to not understand. The first is that most people I meet, or many people I meet, seem to feel that blindness means that you are in the dark. And that is the exclusive experience of blindness shared by all people who fall into the category of having blindness or low vision. And so I really want to get the opportunity to have a conversation about what really is legal blindness? What is the legal definition of legal blindness? What is the functional reality of the different types of vision loss that people might be experiencing? And how each of those conditions brings with it a different type of visual experience? So that's one thing I'd like to talk about tonight. Another thing is how do blind people get around? So I've talked a lot on this show about getting around with a guide dog, using a guide dog, because that's my personal preference and the experience that has been mine for the past almost 29 years, but there are a lot of other options. And so I decided that as with all of my past shows, if there's an ex expert that I can bring in to make me look really good, that's what I'm gonna do. So I found one and I have with me tonight, John Wykelonis. He is a um, orientation and mobility specialist working for the Bureau of Education and Services for the Blind. And John and I have worked together I've been a client, he's given me mobility lessons, and I have also worked with him on other types of trainings where we talk to people about vision loss and about using mobility devices. Thank you so much for being here tonight, John. And thank you for inviting me, it's my pleasure. And now it's your job to make him look really good tonight, okay? I will. Okay, <laughs> awesome. So I wanna ask you first, having worked in this field for many years, tell me what is the legal when, when someone says legally blind what does that really mean basically there are two definitions of legal blindness one is an acuity definition or a sharpness of vision and the other is a field restriction definition and either one will qualify someone as being legally blind and it's important to realize what these definitions are because as you mentioned most people think when you're blind either you can see or you can't see Statistics say that probably something like 90% of the people that are blind actually have some degree of vision. So only maybe 10, 11, 12% are what we'd call totally blind where they don't see anything. But there are, the definitions are kind of interesting. The first one states, and it's a little confusing to hear it, but I'll explain it, is if you have a visual acuity of 2200s or less in the best eye with correction, you would be determined to be legally blind. Now what does that mean? 2200s means that what you and I, can, what someone can see at 200 feet, somebody who's legally blind would have to walk up to within 20 feet to see the same picture that we're seeing way back at 200 feet, okay? Another thing is the big E on the eye chart. That's the 2200s line. So if all you could see is that and nothing beyond that, then you'd be legally blind. Now, it's important to realize that that's with the best possible correction. Now, we all know people who will take their glasses off and they can't see the back of the room but they put their glasses on, it can be corrected. 
Legal blindness is best po the best vision they can have is the 2200s with correction. It's been very, very important to realize that. Now, the second one is the field restriction. This is much less well understood. When you and I look forward, we have a visual field of approximately 180 degrees, okay? Basically, half our sphere we can see. So that's why when we're driving particularly, we can say we saw something out of the corner of our eye. However, somebody who's legally blind would have to get up, to, would have to have a field restriction of about 20 degrees or less, roughly like looking through a tunnel or a tube, and that's legal blindness. Now, it's important to realize also that you can have an acuity or a sharpness of vision of 2020 within that tube, but as long as you have that 20 degree tube or less, you're still to be determined to be legally blind. So you may know someone who says, oh, they're, they're blind, but oh, I saw that dime on the ground, I'm going to pick it up. Well, it just happened to fall within that little tube of vision that they had. So again, acuity definition, field restriction definition, either one will qualify you for legal blindness. So if I'm understanding you correctly, essentially what you're saying is that within that 22 hundredths or less, mm -hmm. it could be anywhere from right on the line right. to total blindness. Exactly. And the same thing with the restriction. You could, you could have a, a, a tiny, tiny little restriction or slightly larger, but if it's under 20 degrees, then you have the legal blindness. That's correct. It could be one or both of, you could have, yeah. you know, a better range of vision, but lower acuity, or you could have a small tube with some. Exactly. It's, it's, it's not uncommon for me to get an eye report that'll say something like three degrees, five degrees, something like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's, and if you think of it, you know, if you're trying to walk around and all you can see is this little, little tube of vision, you're going to have a lot of trouble tripping over things, you know, walking into things on your side, low hanging branches are going to be a problem. You're going to have some definite issues with your mobility. Absolutely. And I want to talk about why legal being determined or, or um, registered as legally blind can be important for a couple of reasons. One is to receive services. In most states, you have to be legally blind to re receive state services. There are other programs that require legal blindness as a qualification. So sometimes someone will get their report from their eye doctor so that they can start receiving services if they're losing their vision. Um, that's not a, you don't want to call it an exciting point to get to, but sometimes if you're right hovering around that point, once you get to the legal blindness, it kind of throws you over a hump into a lot of services that are available. So I think that's an important thing for it is a very viewers to know. Yeah. Is and it's, it is. And also one of the things that they should realize that in the state of Connecticut, it is state law that if a uh, vision provider sees someone in their office who they feel may be legally blind, they are um, duty bound by law to let us know and to pass their name on to us so we can contact them about services. Okay. Um, so now we've talked a little bit about what legal blindness is, but what, what causes it? I know that there are probably as many visual conditions as there are, you know, um, flavors of jelly beans, but, <laughs> you know, but it's, let's, it's let's, interesting. let's touch on some of the more, more prominent ones. Yeah, it is interesting because I've been doing this for, you know, over 36 years and it seems like every year I, I, I you know, have someone on my caseload who I've never heard of that particular eye condition. So there, you're right, there are many, many different causes of blindness, um, but there are some that are more common than others. And um, I'm going to go over some of the more common ones that I see. Um, the, the first one that I'd, I always mention is um, macular degeneration. And macular degeneration, unfortunately, is associated uh, with the aging. It tends to strike people who are, you know, we'll call late 70s, early 80s. And what happens is you get a deterioration of the, your central part of your vision. Basically, you get a blind spot right in the center of your vision. And unfortunately, it's where your, your macula is, and that's where your, your vision cells are most tightly packed together so you get your finest vision. And so it doesn't take a lot of damage to really affect your ability to drive, your ability to read, your ability to do many daily uh, activities as well. Um, a, good, a good way of simulating this is to, if you will, make a fist and place it over the bridge of your nose and then try and look at someone. And if I look at you, I literally cannot see your face right now. And that's what macular degeneration does. It places a blind spot right where you look. And when you move your eye, that blind spot moves with you. You can't look around it. Now, you still have some side vision but your vision is not nearly as clear. And there are a couple of different types of macular degeneration. There's a, something called the dry form of macular degeneration, which is a gradual and happens over time. And there's a wet form, which is a little bit more serious because it's characterized by bleeding and can take away vision a little more quickly. Um, and that, right now, I'd say probably 75% of the people I see, that's, the, that's what's caused their legal blindness right now. And of course, with the population aging, that has led to many, many more people um, um, getting legally blind, unfortunately. 
Um, just the opposite of that um, is uh, something called something that leads to tunnel vision, as we discussed, and glaucoma is one of the leading causes of that. Glaucoma is caused by excess pressure in the eye, and what happens is the pressure builds in the eye in such a way that it actually crushes and damages the optic nerve. Um, and what people need to realize also is that it, it's not something that you can feel in most cases. There are cases where it, it can happen very suddenly, but in most cases it's a fairly gradual pressure and it's enough to cause damage. So it's very, very important for people as part of their routine eye exam to get that glaucoma test to pick it up early because there are drugs and treatments that can help it certainly before the damage becomes really serious. Um, a couple of other, other ones that we see, um, diabetes, of course, is uh, something that uh, many people have. Uh, and in certain cases, you can get what's called diabetic retinopathy, which leads to, um, which is really caused by, uh, well, diabetes is a systemic condition and it leads to a weakening of the blood vessels in the body and your eye of course is very richly supplied with very fine blood vessels and so what happens is they will weaken and you'll get some bleeding and you'll get a couple of problems. You get bleeding within the eye which will affect the vitreous fluid um, and cloud it up a little bit and you'll also get um, some scar tissue where that bleeding is occurred because the, as the body repairs it you may have to go in for some treatments to, to get, take care of that bleeding and that will lead to patchy parts of vision as well. Um, and Diabetes is one of those conditions, diabetic retinopathy is one of those conditions that unfortunately uh, can lead to variable vision where you will have vision that's good one day, bad the next depending on the condition of your retina at that particular time. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I, I know people with that and, and that's, that is frustrating because it's, um, it can be so suddenly different. Mm -hmm. It's not gradual in any way, shape or form. Yeah, it changes, it, you know, pretty dramatically, pretty pretty immediately. Yeah, exactly. And a couple more uh, conditions that we see, uh, de retinal detachment is when the whole back of the retina detaches in, 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 par in, in part or in whole and can lead to uh, vi functional vision loss as well because the kind of like the, the connectors lose connection with each other in the back of the eye. Um, and then you've got um, something, uh, cataracts is another cause that we see, but not nearly as frequently as we did in the past. Um, cataract is, of course, a clouding in the lens of the eye. It's like a window that gets kind of dirty. Um, years ago, it was a pretty serious condition. Now, cataract surgery is very common, uh, usually very successful. My, my own mom had a cataract surgery at age 70. She sees better than I do. She, you know, she doesn't wear glasses. She can see things <laughs> I can't awesome. see now. So it, it's really uh, been a, a big success story in the medical field. Um, and something that we still see occasionally, though, with people who have cataracts that, for whatever reason, can't be operated on, we will see it. Um, so those are some of the leading causes of blindness that I see that, that come across. Now, most of what you've talked about now are what we would call acquired um, blindness. Correct. Which is that someone was born with vision mm -hmm. that worked typically, and through some sort of illness of the eye or, or other illness of their body, um, became became started dealing with vision loss mm -hmm. and of course there's congenital blindness where you're born blind or there's blindness because of not as much anymore but there's the blindness because of oxygen mm -hmm. that was more common um correct yeah yeah no one has uh, retinopathy of prematurity now rop right correct. but yeah. it's but there are still people who have it mm -hmm. um and then of course being having been to guide dog school many times and been with other groups of blind people you know, there are the um battle in in you know um injuries received it in service it, mm -hmm. it, as a veteran um there are obviously because of accidents um and other things like that that people can lose their vision um so there's all these uh, there's all these different ways and i i can tell you that i've been in a lot of rooms with a lot of blind people and it seems like none of us had exactly the same experience it's yes. not it's not there's no there's nothing cookie cutter mm -hmm. about this no, in, in my not experience at all. there's nothing not at cookie all. cutter and what that means is that a it can be really hard to, for the general public, you know, the, 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 the people who may, may not know any blind people or may know one blind person. Their grandma might have lost their vision because of, um, re of um, macular degeneration, or maybe they had a grandfather who lost their vision um, because of some other age-related condition. But they have no idea of all these other things. And even when you get a bunch of blind people together, Sometimes we're like, wow, like that's how that that's your deal, like that's your story. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. That's so different from my story. Um, but what all of that means is that navigating the world, physically getting around through the world, is something that is going to be very difficult and dangerous if you don't have good usable vision. If you have a legal blindness, whether it's um, you know macular degeneration, whether it's central vision loss or peripheral vision loss, all of those things are going to affect your ability to safely navigate through the world. And 
So there are a few options on how to, to, to counterbalance that. One of them, of course, is using a guide dog, which is the choice mm-hmm. that I, I have made. Um, but there are other choices, and you have brought with you some examples of um, some of the ways that people can, can navigate through the world. And, you know, I'm jumping ahead of myself because I just remembered something that we talked about before we started the show. Mm-hmm. You had talked about some sunglasses that people can use. And I was really interested because when I think of sunglasses, of course, I think of people wearing them only outside when it's really sunny. But that's what people do. That's mm-hmm. what you sighted people do when it's sunny. Um, what I didn't realize is that there are a lot of really interesting different types of sunglasses that you're familiar with and some that even get used inside for certain things. So mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about those. Yeah, most people who have some kind of vision loss, um, their eye just doesn't process light the way it used to. Even as we get older, our, our eyes just don't process light the way they used to. So very often sunglasses are very handy. Um, so one of the things that we often do is we evaluate people for sunglasses to help them really utilize their, their remaining vision to the best extent possible. And if you can reduce glare, a lot of times people, you know, I've actually had people put on some sunglasses and it's practically like, wow, I can see again, which is really gratifying that I was able to help them in that way. Um, it's not always going to be for everyone like that, but in many cases it can help. Um, I'm going to show some of the sunglasses that we have available. And the first one, you mentioned indoor sunglass. This is kind of a, uh, a yellowish type color. Um, and this one is very, very good for enhancing contrast. And it's very good for indoors. And I'll just put, the, put these on. And these brighten things up and make it a little bit more visible. You know, if I'm looking in the shadow, I can actually see better in the shadow by putting these on. Very, very handy. A lot of people really, really like these. And some people can even use these like on a, a cloudy day to enhance contrast when mm-hmm. we have that, that flat type of light. Another type of sunglass is, uh, well, they come in various tints. When I'm looking at sunglasses, I'm looking at two things. I'm looking at tinting, the coloration, and I'm looking at the light transmission, how dark they are. And obviously, people have different preferences, what works best for them. Um, the ones I'm showing you are mostly in the medium tones. This is a, a 7-Eleven. This is a, uh, um, a place kind of a, an amber. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this is, or like the store, as I say. Um, but this one is, a, is an amber color. It's a good outdoor sunglass. It's kind of in the, the yellow family, but again, heightens the contrast, but also um, will cut that glare quite substantially and works very well. Other people, they prefer a kind of a, a bluish tint, more gray tone, which will keep things more natural in color, yet still reduce the glare. And these particular sunglasses that I'm sh- I've shown you are very good because they have shielding on the sides and on the top, so they really encapsulate the eye very nicely. Also, what's nice about these is that they will fit over regular glasses so that you can wear them either without glasses or with glasses, depending on your... And we have smaller versions of this. We have larger versions of this trying to to kind of fit people as well. Um, We have regular sunglasses. For those who really just want a regular sunglass, I'll just demonstrate these briefly, put these on. And just it's it's just a regular sunglass. Not quite as much protection, but still very, very effective for some people. Um, So we do offer a variety of sunglasses. And in in many cases, we can um, fit somebody with a a nice sunglass that will help them improve their vision. Um, Just as an aside, I have worked um, this past year or two with some people who had extremely uh, light sensitivity, and I was able to get them sunglasses that cut out you know, up to 99% of the uh, the light coming to their eyes because they described the light as actually hurting their eyes. It was painful. And with these type of sunglasses on, they were actually able to go outside. Um, so there are things that are available for just about any kind of light condition you can imagine. Now, I know that as a um, blind person, sometimes I get asked, where are my sunglasses? And I think that's because there are people who have who are blind, who may have some disfigurement to their eyes, that choose to wear sunglasses for aesthetic purposes, um, and they wear them all the time. And then there are people who wear sunglasses strictly to deal with light sensitivity. Mm-hmm. And there are blind people who never wear sunglasses because they don't, they're not choosing to need or choosing to use them for aesthetic purposes, and they're not using them for light um, blockage either. But it is a very common stereotype. Some of the most common questions I get asked um, especially when I'm talking to really young children, are where are your sunglasses and when did you start playing the piano? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stevie Wonder uh, and Ray Charles. Um, and those are just some of the stereotypes that blind people wear sunglasses. And I know sometimes when I'm in a restaurant and people don't see my guide dog and they don't realize that I'm, that I am blind because the, you know, they're not noticing that. And I know that sometimes I think, well, if I was wearing sunglasses and it, I was in the restaurant, they might, you know, cue on that particular mm-hmm. visual um, sort of cue, 
but I, I think that's interesting that you know sunglasses sometimes just serve an aesthetic purpose but um, another thing that I just thought of really quickly and we won't go into it very deeply but lighting is so important and and that that could be another five hour conversation like this yes. one could go on for five hours but I think it's really important for people to remember especially if they're dealing with changing vision or, or, or losing their vision that the type of lighting that they have in their home or in their workspace and particularly in kitchens and bathrooms can make a tremendous difference Yes. in their effective in their ability to function within their environment yeah very true and we have rehab teachers that go into people's homes and can advise them on the lighting and help them maybe to improve the lighting and in general more lighting is better yes um, so it yeah. helps you to really utilize that vision much easier so since I had jumped ahead of myself mm -hmm. let's go back to mobility devices okay and, and I have what a are table some full of, the of them options? here <laughs> I, I, I bet I knew you would you always have the mm -hmm. best ones okay I want to talk about uh, the first type of cane I'm going to talk about is uh, just a regular support cane um, white canes are generally recognized as, as being carried by people who are visually impaired or blind and only a person who is blind is actually allowed to carry a white cane and so very often particularly with macular degeneration people are still they're visual travelers because they can kind of see out of the corner of their eyes but they want the public to be aware that they are legally blind so we offer a couple of different types of support type canes and I'm gonna just get up here briefly and a support type cane is used as you would use like a regular support cane where you hold it off to the side and you just sort of walk with it and it's good for depth perception it's good for identifying yourself as being visually impaired you can even see something that was that a hole in the ground or shadow and kind of poke at it as well with the cane. So it's a very, very handy tool. And we have a couple of different ones. I have uh, one that you typically might find in a drugstore with a nice soft handle, only they're paisley and all sorts of different colors, <laughs> not white. And then we've got another style here, which is um, you know, a rounded type handle. Uh, same, serves the same purpose, and it's just, you know, people have different uh, preferences in terms of what feels right in their hands. And, we'll, you know, I'll set it up with them and walk with it and make sure they're safe using it as well. So you'll very often see someone carrying this type of cane, these support type canes. Now, for someone who has um, a little bit more serious visual impairment and maybe wants a cane for another purpose, I have three different ones with me. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is a kind of a, what we call an ID cane. And this is a long, thin cane. I'm going to unfold it here. And this is a cane. It's called an ID cane. It's main, used mainly for identification. And somebody might want to carry this as they're walking just so people know they're visually impaired. Indoors, they might be able to sweep it in front of them just a little bit to clear their path as they're walking. Um, but it's a nice, handy cane. Folds up very, very compactly like this. And you can put it in your purse, in your wallet, stick it in your belt, whatever. Very handy cane. The next cane is a, what I call a light duty cane, a little bit tougher. And again, you can unfold it and you can sweep it in front of you, uh, used for identification, but a little bit tougher. It has a little marshmallow tip on the end here, has a little soft grip and a very handy cane as well. I carry for one of those purposes. with me all the time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, a good spare cane. Me. Something yeah. happens to the dog, yeah. you need to I need be the, mobile. Yes, absolutely. Yep. You can do that. Now, the last cane I'm going to show you will be is what I call the SUV of canes. It can do anywhere, it can do anything, go anywhere, and you're going to hear the difference in how this unfolds. It's and just, that one this, will bite. This cane if you means get your business. Fingers in the yes, way of those this cane means sections. business. Yep. And this has what's called a rolling marshmallow tip on it, and you use this by putting it in front of you and sweeping it back and forth. And you might see somebody who has a more serious eye condition using this where they have little or no vision where they actually need to feel their way around the environment. And this one it can take a licking and still keep going. Very, very handy cane. Um, quick story, uh, we, about uh, the, uh, probably about 15, 16 years ago now, we were giving out canes to children and uh, they would break them. <laughs> you know, oh, they yes. would just break them, they would jam. <laughs> I get calls all the time, Mr. John, come fix my cane or give me a new cane. So we saw these and uh, we decided to order some and, and from that day forward essentially, kids, they couldn't break these. They would outgrow them, but they rarely broke them. So it was a very, very tough cane. Um, obviously, as you know, there is training involved with canes and that's something that we do at uh, Services for the Blind. We will go out, um, I'm a certified orientation and mobility specialist and I'll go out, evaluate your need, and then train you as appropriate for how to use one of these long canes uh, in the environment, um, traveling around wherever uh, you're interested. What's interesting, and something I didn't know when I started the, the odyssey of getting a guide dog for the first time, I thought that once I was a guide dog trainer, I'm sorry, guide dog trainer, <laughs> guide dog user, um, 
my cane would become obsolete mm -hmm. and that my cane skills were not necessarily going to be important. And what I learned is that being a successful, accomplished cane traveler is critical to being a guide dog user because the orientation skills that you have are the same. And I also learned that my cane is never something that should be far from hand because occasionally I'll go someplace without my dog and I will want to go to the restroom or do something independently uh, and need the cane to do that. And as you said, I tell my low vision um, members of my support groups all the time, if you're not carrying something to identify yourself as a person with a visual impairment, the world is going to expect you to behave typically when you're walking toward them. And they don't have a chance to possibly make the right choice and get out of your way or make or a driver to know that you don't see them there if you don't even give them the chance to know that you're not seeing typically. Um, so those are some really important things. One of the things I'm going to ask that you do, John, is to um, let us show the audience what sighted guide is. Sighted guide is a technique in which you can use a sighted person if, as a blind person if you don't have a cane. And I always tell the joke that my brother, when he was told he had his options of a guide dog or a cane, he said, well, I'd prefer a tall blonde, but if she gets mad, she can walk away. Yep. So he had to make a choice. And um, so you get to play a tall blonde on TV tonight is, <laughs> is what you get to do. Um, so we will, I will have John demonstrate um, what it is because anyone in the audience may encounter someone in their family, may encounter a stranger on the street, may somehow need to assist a person who is blind or visually impaired. And having a, just a tiny bit of knowledge in your pocket is tremendous. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that if someone has a little bit of knowledge. I don't expect everyone to be an expert. Um, my mom, of course, having had two blind children, can get two blind people through a crowd faster than most people can get their own self through. But when you don't have the experience, just a little bit of knowledge can be, can be really very helpful. Um, before we go on to the sighted guide demonstration, John, is there anything I haven't touched on tonight that I should? No, you're very thorough on all these things. Um, I, I particularly appreciate your fact that you said that, you know, even for a guide dog, they, they like, you, like you to have had some cane training. And I have prepped people to get a guide dog, and it's been very helpful to have that training. Absolutely. So for sighted guide, typically there's a right way, there's a wrong way to guide somebody. And I'm going to show you how the easiest way to guide somebody is. Usually what you want to do is you want to make contact with them both verbally and tactically. So I might say something like, come with me or take my arm, something like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to brush my, the back of my hand up against hers. And she's going to grab me by the elbow with what we call a pincer grip. It's like holding a glass of water. And what I want to do is I want to stay kind of close to her. We don't want to avoid this winging out type thing. And you want to stay about a step in front of her because you are the guide, so you want to always be in front of her. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a comfortable pace, and I'm going to always be aware that I've got somebody on my side, so if I go by obstacles, I'm going to leave a little extra space. We'll just start off slowly. And again, we're going to set a comfortable pace. She can feel when I start. She can feel when I stop. She can feel as I make my turn here to go back. And she can just basically very easily follow the movements of my body. And this works out very, very well when you're guiding somebody. As you can see, it's very easy for someone to follow me. Now, if you get to a step or a stair, or even any kind of elevation change, you always want to let the person know. You want to stop at a stair, you might say, or a, or a curb, let's say. You want to say there's a step down. You would step down, then they would step down. You also want to let them know if there's an elevation change, like wheelchair ramps are very common nowadays. Um, if you don't slow down or let them know, they're going to get what I call that phantom step. So what you want to do is slow down, say there's a wheelchair ramp, and then continue slowly so they know that their feet are going to be going down a little bit more. Now, occasionally you're going to come upon a situation where it's, this is too wide. It's hard to get two people through. Um, I think of restaurants as a prime example. So we have something called narrow passageway, and that's how you guide somebody through a narrow area, like in a restaurant around the tables or something like that. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my arm behind me, and what Andrea is going to do is she's going to do two things. She's going to slip her grip from my elbow to my wrist, and she's going to step behind me. So it looks like, and I'm, what I'm going to do is put my arm behind me, and that's going to be the clue for her to do those things. So I would say, Andrea, we're going to a narrow area. Put my arm behind me, and she does. I'm going to turn sideways just to show you what that looks like. I now put my arm out a little bit. She's gripping me by my wrist, and I've got my arm out a little bit so she can follow me. And we're just going to take a few steps like that. And then when we'd be through, I'd have her get back to regular sided guide. Okay, and I'll bring you back here. So that's regular sided guide, 
narrow passageway. And the last thing I want to show you essentially is how to guide somebody to a chair. Uh, you know, if the, you need to seat somebody or something like that, you always want to put them in contact with something. You don't want to leave them standing in space. So if you're with somebody and you have to go, put them against a wall, put them in a chair, introduce them to someone else, but don't leave them standing in space. And don't just walk off, certainly, without letting them know. So, Andrea, I'm going to show you to a chair. It's a regular chair. If there's any special conditions about the chair, particularly if it's a, on a swivel or it's got wheels or anything like that, you always want to let the person know this is just a regular chair. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my arm to in right on the seat, let her find it, and then I'm going to step aside and basically let her seat herself. If this chair was at a table, I'd be approaching it to the side, putting one hand on the table, one hand on the chair, and then she can seat herself. And that's essentially how Sighted Guide works. Thank you for tuning in this evening to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. Thank you, John, for being my guest. And remember, everyone, be good to each other and have a wonderful month.